الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله last week we started speaking about certain issues certain topics that are very relevant to us and alhamdulillah we covered few things that are necessary for us to know in in the order so that we can understand how do we actually analyze and how do we look at different things as far as our deen is concerned and as far as the the fitness of society and we covered last week some of the issues such as knowing what the Islamic worldview is to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fashioned us in the most correct and precise manner. There is no mistakes in the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we recognize that every single thing in the world is fashioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a reason, we understand that we have a purpose in this life. And that purpose is to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the guidance given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah this week, uh, again, we're going to be touching up on the same topic, but continuing on to the story of Lut alayhi salam, and especially what lessons do we take from the lessons of Lut alayhi salam? What does the Quran tell us about how we are responsible for our bodies and what is marriage in Islam? What is sexual deviance? And how is it termed in Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran about it? And we'll go through the entire story of Lut alayhi salam and take lessons from it. So the first uh, phrase and the first passage we're going to actually look at is speaking about the body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is our Khaliq. He is our Creator. And as such, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is the best for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has selected us so that we may worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in one ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one. Allah He starts with the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has made night so that you may seek tranquility and ease and the day so that you may actually do something and see in allah ladhu fadlan ala an-nas walakinna akthar an-nas la yashkurun indeed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is the one possessor of all virtue but however many of the people they are not thankful and then he continues dhalikum allah rabbukum khaliqu kulli shay in the few remember whenever we look at the ayats we look at the verses before, we look at the verses after, and we understand what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us here. He says, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your Lord, the one who has created you and created everything. La ilaha illahu. There is no God except him. What are you fabricating? What are you making up? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Similar, this is the same way these people, they fabricate and they made up ways and they made up things that they do in their life that they're going that they they deny and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says he is the one who has made the land uh firm and flat for us and was sama abina'a and he has made the skies as a as a foundation and then false he has compiled and he has fashioned and he has designed insan not just any way in the best form in the best way so we understand this this body of ours is something that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us as a way of a loan just like a person he they take a loan from anybody uh in the dunya and they have to return that loan 
You can't take a car and lease it and then scratch it up. You can't rent something and then you know break the walls and break the toilets. So similar way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who owns our body. Our bodies are a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way we dress, we have free will. The what food that we eat, we have free will. The exercise of the body, all of these things, they are the free will of an individual. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And when we look in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there is a, 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 you know, there's many, many a hadith chapters that have been written upon the rights of the body upon the person. So a person must take care of their body. A person will be asked about their body. So one hadith, which is a very famous hadith is one of the companions, they were comparing themselves to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, three of them. And they came to a stage where they said that this is a Nabi, this is a Prophet. There is no way that we can compete with him. So what are we going to do? We're going to do more than what he is doing. And one of those individuals, they continued their fast and they kept fasting and fasting. Another of those individuals, they never married. And they said that I will not marry. Another of those individuals, individuals they said that we're not going to, I'm not going to go to sleep. The result was when they, the Prophet ﷺ found out, he told them that there is rights upon the body. There is rights upon the wife. There is rights upon every single thing has its own due rights. So we hear this saying a lot, my body, my choice, especially in social media. And we hear this. Uh, in many places, we need to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has full control over our body. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's trust. And when we look into the trust of Allah, we're not allowed to do anything with that trust except from what He wills. So for example, I put some examples here. Uh, organ donation, blood, blood uh, 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 drives and giving part of a limb of a person. All of these things, these are considered amanat from Allah. They're trusts. So every single thing that we do, it has to be in line with that trust. So that's why a person, it's a, it's a responsibility, an obligation upon the person to understand that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us. Now, when we talk about, you know, in Islam, we don't look at sex as something that is bad we have to understand this you know especially growing up a person may think that this is something that is you know taboo and something that is not mentioned in the quran there's many verses allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions about the fact that people this is how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions that when the husband and the wife they cover each other then there is progeny that comes from this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the stages of takhliq, stages of creation. Before science even, you know, looked into it and found the research for it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he first mentions that there is a, there is a drop, then there is a alaqa, there is a clot, then after that there is flesh, and then after the flesh, then there is bones, then those bones get meat. All of that has been mentioned. So we understand there is no, uh, uh, you know, definition of a bad you know, life of relations. Rather, when we speak about Islam and sex, it's not implied as an evil or bad act in Islam. In other religions, it is. Right? As long as a person is within the bounds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid out. And there is many ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, ذلك, Whoever seeks beyond that, they are considered transgressors. So we have the circle and this, the, the realm and the area of halal and permissible. And then there is areas where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if a person does more than this, they have now transgressed. So even within the halal, there is areas where a person is not allowed to do. We understand that the needs and the desires of a person, they are fulfilled with the needs, uh, uh, with the, the spouse a person has within the marriage. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he mentioned even in a hadith that if a person, they see something that they are attracted to and they, their eyes fall upon that individual, immediately run back to your wife. Why? 
Because what she has, what the person he saw has, exactly the wife has that. So fulfill those desires in a legal, permissible way. So this is something very important. Even within the marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for forbidden us from certain actions. That the person must be within the bounds and the restrictions that are permissible. Anything beyond that, anything away from that is not permissible. So for example, the limitations is that a man must be with his wife and the wife must be with the man, his, her husband. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa actually has sent curse upon a person who practices sodomy with his wife. And if a person is, has a lot of urge, then even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that take responsibility, take the, the need of what a person has, and even a person is allowed to marry up to four wives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a legal, permissible way to fulfill the desires of a person, whether man or woman. Now what happens? Sexual deviance happens. And this is, you know, we can define this as behaviors where individuals seek erotic gratification through means that are considered odd, different, or unacceptable to either most or most of the uh, community of a person. So these are things that a person, you know, in our life, this is always changing. A person may think that this is okay, but as time goes on, there's new things that keep added to this list. The things that people are, uh, you know, fantasizing about, the people are thinking about, and the list keeps going and going. So Islam, we have a limitation on this, that number one, everything be, must be in wedlock, right? Anything that a person does outside of wedlock, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, wala taqrabu zina, don't even come close to fornication. And the marriage is the way that a person protects themselves from impermissible actions and impermissible ways of fulfilling their desires. So let's look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And there's many ayat verses about this. But this passage is in Surah Mu'minun, the beginning of Surah Mu'minun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Qad aflah al -mu'minun. In the beginning of the surah, he says, Indeed, successful are the believers. So who are the believers? And then he starts listing qualities of those believers. In the tafsir of these ayat, it's mentioned that if a person brings these qualities, these 11, 10 qualities that are mentioned in the beginning of the surah, then they will be entering into Jannah. And one of those is, Those that are protectors of their private parts. This is considered the, the, the haya of a person. Except with their wives, meaning they fulfill their desires with their wives, or their, the ones that they have in their possession, then they will not be considered blameworthy. Whoever seeks more than that, more than what is permissible, then they are transgressors. So we understand even in the permissible things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put limitations that a person can only fulfill their desires in the permissible manner. This is the definition of what Islam has, the family structure. And that's what the, the need of the time is, to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a way for a person to live within the family, within the marriage. Many times, people, or especially youth, they start to wonder, What's the point of getting married? Why should we get married? Well, they're going out with girls. They're having multiple friends that they're intimate with. So ultimately what happens is they, they're asking this question, what does marriage give us? Is it just a you know, promise and a commitment that you're only going to be with this one individual? Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. That the marriage is not just... Uh, uh, you know, a contract. Yes, it is a contract between two people. But that marriage and that union, that relationship is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا From the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He has created for you spouses. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you may live with them and find comfort with them. 
وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he put between you compassion and mercy. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةِ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Indeed, they, in, in this, there are signs for those individuals that really ponder over this. So the benefit of marriage, the benefit of having a relationship that a person is in, this is from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in our society, let's just compare really quick. In our society, marriage is looked down upon. In our society, marriage is not even defined correctly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning this. Azwaj means pairs. Zawj means pair. So for a man, that means a wife. or a wife, that means a man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has defined this. And in the sharia, there is a responsibility and obligation that must be carried out for each individual. So a husband, when they, they marry a wife, they have now obligation to take care of them. They have now obligation that they didn't have before, such as any child that comes from that wedlock, that, will, that child will have their lineage attached. This is a marriage. You see in our society, this is not found. Majority of the individuals that are born in our country right now, they're born out of wedlock. They're born in a society where marriage is seen as something, you know, backwards. People in the past used to do this. And majority of the incidents because of the family structure, they're ending up in divorces. So the marriage is there to protect an individual. It gives rights, obligation upon the deen of a person. And the most important aspect of the marriage, especially when we speak about, you know, uh, the agenda behind the LGBT is they want to break down the marriages. And I'll tell you why. It, the feed of liberalism is that every single person has the right that they should do whatever they want, which pleases them. This is an individualistic person. And the society is feeding on this, saying that this is what we should be doing. Whatever makes you happy, do that. And whatever doesn't make you happy, what concern does it have? So for example, why should a mother take care of their children rather than having a career where they're you know, working and having you know, one job title after another job title after another job title? What does the society give? What do you get out of this? And if you realize it, you know, they're attacking the core, the family unit. And when that family unit breaks down, what happens? A person now, there is no, uh, uh, you know, tarbiyat, there is no upbringing of the children in the home. And ultimately, the individualistic values of a person that they want to have multiple spouses, they want to do such and such things that makes them happy, that will break the entire family. So then why must... Uh, you know, a person even marry, that com uh, question comes about. That's why it's very important that we realize Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he says in one hadith that an nikahu min sunnati, the nikah, it is from my habits, from my path. And whoever strays away from my path, then falaysa minni, then that person is not from my, my ummah. And that's not in a reality sense that they're going to be now non-Muslim. No, no. That's actually speaking about the fact that they will be considered as if they are leaving the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. They will be blameworthy. Right? So that's why it's very important that we understand that the society around us is not always in favor of what is correct. It's not in the favor of what is Islamic values. In the Islamic values, these issues of having urges and desires would not even come about if people started getting married. Now people are getting so old, they don't even know how they're going to find a spouse. That's why coming back to the original way of life, which is a person must marry. A person in that marriage, there is all the desires a person wants, but without getting away from the limitations put by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the example and the evidence of this is in the Quran. And this is very, very important for us to understand. Anytime we speak about, you know, uh, the LGBT movement, we're always referring to the story of Lut al-Islam. But the story of Lut al-Islam, there's few 
points that we have to understand in the story that is the answer for us on how do we respond and what talking points do we have when we're facing anybody that is pushing their agenda upon us. And this is, again, you know, there's more than one way to look at this, but the Qur'an is final. The Qur'an is final. We can give many, many arguments that are in logical fashion and, you know, uh, with the emotional way or the logical way or whatever. But the Qur'an, when we see the Qur'an, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, we have to realize Qur'an is final. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this for the sake of showing individuals and showing people this is till the yawm al-qiyamah. This is till the day of judgment. So we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the reasons why he reveals verses is nas. These are days that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he changes it up with the people. One day, you know, this uh, a certain mentality and a certain fitna will be there. Another day, another fitna, another certain mentality will be there. So when we look at the significance of the people of Lut al-Islam, let's ask ourselves certain questions and look for the answers of these questions in the story of Lut al-Islam. See, every prophet, when they are sent to their people, they're sent with the message and they continue giving their message until the people are pushing them out, rejecting them, kicking them out of their towns. And then what happens is they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to them that they will, they will not believe anymore. And then the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes upon them. This is found in all the stories of all the prophets. And we know the Quran is an eternal kitab, et eternal book. And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this story more than one place in the Quran, that time after time we hear, remember the mention of Lut, when we saved him and we gave him hikmat and we gave him prophethood. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying all of this? What is the lessons we can take from this story? So the first thing is, does the Quran explicitly mention these actions as haram? And how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention them as impermissible? So let's look at that when we discuss the verses that are going to come. And let's look at that when we discuss the story of the people of Lut al-Islam. Another main you know, argument that people say, is there any evidence that implies that the people of Lut al-Islam received a punishment due to rape, not homosexuality? Because this is one of the, sadly, the worst, actually, uh, worst types of arguments that they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the story of Lut al-Islam and what happened with the people of Lut al-Islam, not because this was something wrong that they were doing. Rather, what is the reason? They, were, they didn't have consent. And because of the fact that they didn't have consent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the adab. Now, when we look at the ayat, it's clear cut in the ayat. You know, you, you, you have to like really go out of your way to really find a different interpretation of the Qur'an and different interpretation of the ayat to say all of these things. Then we see also another thing that we must ask ourselves, what lessons can be taken and how is this going to, that incident of the people of Lut al-Islam going to repeat itself? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in one of the verses, this is the first time this has happened. So men... If it's something is the first time, does that mean it's going to continue? Yes, that's why we need to understand what is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us. And then the warning of the punishment. What is the job of the messenger regarding the people? How did Lut al-Islam deal with his people? And finally, we're going to see what was their outcome and what was the outcome of those individuals that supported the, the actions of Lut al-Islam, of the people of Lut al-Islam. So, Lut al-Islam, he is the nephew of Ibrahim al-Islam. Right, Ibn Kathir, he mentions that Lut al-Islam, his father, Haran, and then his father, Azar. Azar was also the father of, according to one uh, uh, riwayat, he was the father of Ibrahim al-Islam. According to another, it says he was his uncle. So, the, whatever the case may be, he is considered the nephew of Ibrahim al-Islam. And these were two, Ibrahim alayhi salam, of course, we know how 
uh, uh, powerful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He mentions that He is a ummah on its own. But how Lut salam was also a prophet at the same time. So Lut salam after being with Ibrahim salam for a while, he was sent to the city of Sadum. Sadum in Arabic, but in English, you know, we say Sodom, right? And this is where the word sodomy comes from, right? The people of Sodom did this action so widespread openly without any haya or shame that even in the Bible, this is mentioned as one of the worst actions. So Lut salam was sent to these people. These people, they had a lot of evil traits. And what evil traits did they have? They used to rob individuals. They used to kidnap individuals. They used to be openly, without any shame, without any uh, you know, remorse, they used to be homosexuals. And if we look at other traditions such as the Bible and even other the Old Testament, there's mention of Sodom and the people of Sodom, the punishment they had, and what was the outcome. So it's not just something in the, the deen, in, in Islam. It's rather found in all of the traditions. And to add on to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the verse, go and see what was the outcome of these individuals. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning that shows us that this was widely known about these individuals. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing verses to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the companions are listening to this. And he says, go and see what was the outcome of those people. Now, if I were to mention something, but not, none of the individuals around me knew something, that would be unheard of. But the fact was, they, these individuals got this adab, this punishment, and it was widely known. It was so commonly known and so popular that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, go and see what was their outcome. What was the outcome of the mujrimin, the criminals? So it was widely known amongst the people that these individuals, the city was a very evil city. It had done a lot of evil things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Lut al-Islam to warn the people and give up their wrong actions. And these individuals, they were overpowered by unnatural desires and refused to listen to Lut al-Islam. This is in a nutshell what happened. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put his adab upon those people. Now, let's look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. This is a long passage. Inshallah, what we'll do is just break it up in a few uh, verses at a time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he starts off the passage. كَذَّبَتْ قَوْمُ لُوتِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ He says, number one, the people of Lut, they belied their prophet. They belied their messengers. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ لُوتٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ And remember when their brother Lut said, will you not believe? إِنِّي لَكُمْ رَسُولٌ أَمِينٌ He said, I am for you a very trustworthy prophet. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَأَطِيعُونَ Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obey me. The prophets, their uh, uh, mission is to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will not ask for any worldly benefit. They didn't do something so that they can get some, you know, um, you know a payment out of it. So what does Lut alayhi salam say? وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرِ I don't ask you for any payment, any recompense. In أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ My recompense is only upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the universe. And then he brings this ayat. أَتَأْتُونَ الذُّكْرَانَ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Lut al-Islam is telling these people, do you come to men from the entire world? You have everything in front of you. You have males, females, everybody. But do you come to men? وَتَذَرُونَ مَا خَلَقَ لَكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ عَادُونَ And you leave all of the creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for you in your spouses. Indeed, you are a very transgressing nation. So one point to make here is look in how in this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing the exact nature of their sin. Their exact nature. And we'll see another ayat where he's saying they, they did a criminal act. They did an evil, vile act. So here he says, Atatuna the Quran. 
do you come to men? Does it mention anything about forcing, compulsion, consent, non-consent? No. And there is a usul and there is a principle in the the ulum al-Quran, the, the principles of the Quran, that anything that is mutlaq, anything that is general, it will be left on its generality. Al-mutlaq yajri ala atlaqihi. If something is general, we're going to leave it general. We're not going to specify that this is the reason or that is the reason. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that, do you come, do you come to males, leaving the wives Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created? Indeed, you are, an, you are a people that have transgressed the bounds. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the, the reply of these individuals. They said, you know, they heard all of this. And they said, قَالُوا لَإِن لَمْ تَنْتَهِيَا لُوتُ لَتَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْمُخْرَجِينَ O Lut, we heard all of this. We listened to this. But if you don't stop, and you don't stop what you're doing, we're going to kick you out of our town. قَالَ إِنِّي لِيَعْمَلِكُمْ مِنَ الْقَالِينَ He said, I am a person that detests the actions that you are doing. And then he made this dua, رَبِّ نَجِّنِي وَأَهْلِ مِمَّا يَعْمَلُونَ O Allah, save me. And my, and my family from what they are doing. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied, and he saved him and his family, except illa ajuzan fil ghabirin. And we'll see why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention this about his wife, that we saved his family, except his old woman, meaning his wife. She was from the ghabirin. She was one from the individuals that were behind. ثُمَّ دَمَّرْنَا الْآخَرِينَ Then what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Then we... We annihilated them. We rained upon them the, the rain. It wasn't actually rain. It was actually uh, brimstone. What an evil outcome. What an evil um, return is for those that have, uh, uh, those that have been warned. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fi dhalika la ayah. Indeed, there is a sign and there is a uh, sign in this. But however, many of them are not believers. So the main point here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this entire story of Lut salam And he mentions that they are coming to men with their desires. Something that was unnatural. And when something goes away from the fitrah and the natural way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, then the outcome is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the end that they got this rain coming upon them, stones with their names written on them. Now, few things that were mentioned in the books of Tafsir. This was unnatural acts, even with spouses is not permissible. Mentions that even if a person with their own spouse, they do things that are not permissible. You know, coming to them from the back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses them and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his curse upon the individual who does this action. Three times he mentioned this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us solutions to each of the issues and urges. The spouse of a person is their means of fulfilling their desires. And in the story of Lut al-Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions old woman. In another place also he mentions old woman. This can either be for the fact that she was old or because of her old relationship, evil relationship with the sins. Meaning she was supporting that sin. She was supporting and what we say in our, in our society, allies. Being an ally of individuals that are sinning. So a person that shows somebody of good actions, they get the same reward as those individuals. A person that does those, uh, shows others of evil action, they will also get the sin of those evil actions. So when his wife allies and supported the people in their actions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her the same outcome as those doing the action. She was from those that were left behind. In another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions the example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example of two women who disbelieved. The wife of Nuh alayhi salam and the wife of Lut alayhi salam. They were under the servants of Allah. Uh, of of Allah, the prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَخَانَتَا And they were, they were traitors. Not in the sense that they did some evil actions. Right? Ibn Kathir clearly says, for a prophet, their family, they will never do something that is a fahish action. Rather, what was their sin? 
What was their sin? It was the sin of kufr. The sin that they supported individuals that were doing bad actions, evil actions. And they said that even though that they were in the nikah and in the marriage of prophets, it didn't benefit them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, enter the fire along with those that enter. So that's why we understand from this aspect of the story, we're not allowed to support, be allies, be individuals who accept this sin or those people that want to ally with us. And there's few questions that usually come up. Number one is where Muslims are min minority within school systems, within job, within uh, you know immigration, whatever it may be, that there's minorities. And then what happens is if we ally ourselves with others that are also a group that is you know a minority, then we will have support. But from the, the story of Lut al-Islam, especially the part of his wife, we learned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never accept a person that supports sin. If a person accepts somebody that supports sin or allies with them or shows them that same sort of you know, unity and brotherhood, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will count us from the same individuals that did that sin. That's, that's the main lesson we learned from this. Some few arguments that people make is people can do whatever makes them happy as long as they don't involve me. We've heard this a lot. It's a, you know, kids come and say this a lot. Why should we care? Why should, we, why should it phase us? The reality is uh, responsible. The characteristic of a responsible believer is if they see something that is wrong, they must speak against it. They must speak against it. And that's in the normal sense. Amal bin ma'roof wa nahi anil muka. That's in the normal sense, not just in this, you know, regard of this agenda and this movement. So whenever something is wrong, we're obliged to make sure that we do the right actions. And especially now going back to this agenda and this movement, we've seen in the past few years, without awareness, without a push, without the Muslims saying that this is wrong what happens is we're being pushed down with their agenda. So much so now, as everybody probably knows, California has a law that if a person of a parent does not affirm the gender of their uh, child that wants to change the gender, that be considered something that is almost the same as child abuse. And they're saying, they had a you know, release saying that we're not, we're not telling people we're gonna take their children. We don't want the children, right? Even though in one of the speeches, Joe Biden says, no, we're going to take care of your children. So they're saying, we don't want the children. They're saying in the situation where there is divorce, who will get the possession of the children? A parent that is not going to be affirming, a parent that is going to be affirming. So let's say a person wants to change and transition, then they will give the, the parent that is going to affirm the gender. That's what they're saying. You will see... These, this is the same way Canada also had their beginning laws. And now it's a state where if a person does not say or even use the same pronouns, it's considered as if the same thing as being racist or same thing as being a bigot. So the same things, same exact pathway, right? The same segues that they use is being implemented here also at the same time. Another argument that's usually used, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants everybody to be loved and happy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants everybody to be loved and happy. So what is the problem in a society where two people of the same sex, they want to get married and they want to live happily? What's the issue with that? The issue with that is there is no happiness in the disobedience of Allah. There is no happiness in the disobedience of Allah. And secondly, when a person is thinking about these sort of issues, you see that if a person just wants to be happy, they're just doing something in their own privacy of their home. They're committing a sin in the privacy of their room. There's no, we, we don't have any right to say anything. But it's happening publicly. You drive down Fremont Boulevard, you know, there's almost three, four flags. You can't miss them. And then at the same time, every city has its own uh, march parade. The celebration, go to the library, there's a whole table decorated just for that. So if it's privately, then why are we seeing it every single place? You can't go to a store without seeing the first section comes up, Pride Month. 
this is this is not being private anymore. So you can't use the argument, Allah wants everybody to be happy, so let them do what makes them happy. No, this is affecting every single individual. Religious or irreligious, doesn't matter. And at the same time, at the same time, it's very important. We have to understand if anybody feels these things, right? We have to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never take anybody into action unless a person does the action. For thoughts and, you know, uh, waswasas, whisperings, attractions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never take anybody into account. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take somebody into account is when they do that sin. Nobody I, it says, you know, America has ruined so many countries. Why isn't there a pride month of Afghanistan? You know, have the colors of Afghanistan on the, the, the flags. Why? Because look what happened. And then Iraq. And then every single country that they've been in, they should be, they're a minority. They're still being, you know, harassed. So they should have their own pride month and day and month and week and everything. Never, that, that doesn't happen. The last issue to mention is if we support them in politics, then we can secure our rights. We mentioned about how that we're not allowed to support anything that is in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, going back to the story, now the angels, they arrive. So when Lut al -Islam, he had made this dua, simultaneously what was happening is three angels came to Ibrahim al -Islam, and they gave him the glad tidings of a son. And they said, he asked them, why are you here? And they said that we have been sent to the people of Lut. And so Ibrahim al -Islam, he was the prophet. He had a lot of shafaqat, he had a lot of compassion. So he said, how is it that you're going to destroy these people? There's loot in it. There is loot in there. Don't destroy them. And then he, they said that we will save them and his family, except his wife. They will be from the ones that are uh, destroyed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent three angels and they came to the town of Sadum. And as they came to the outskirts and the outer portion of the town, the daughter of Lut salam, she was there filling water. And as, she, as soon as she saw them, she saw them, these individuals that she's never seen, very beautiful individuals. And she was in her heart, she felt very scared that these individuals, they're going to be mistreated. They're going to be abused and something's going to happen to them if they go into this town. And they came and they said to her that, where can we be uh, taken as guests? Where can, who can host us? So she's told them, stay here, don't go anywhere, and I will run to my father and I will come back. She ran to Lut al -Islam. She told Lut al -Islam that, oh, my father, I have seen individuals that I have never seen be before. You must come and you must help them. So Lut al -Islam, he came to them and he was so afraid. He was trying to actually convince them. Mentions in the books of Tafsir, he was convincing them not to come. Don't be, uh, don't stay the night here. In this town but at the same time they they were asking for you know a, a host so that they can be guests and somebody can take care of them so he tried to convince them and ultimately he decided to take them to his house at night time so nobody can see nobody will know what happens is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he made it such where they went to him at, uh, in, in in his house at night time and nobody knew and this is where the wife of Lut al -Islam, she saw the fact that there is new guests, new individuals she's never ever seen before. And she's never seen them. And they're so handsome. They're so beautiful. Then she slipped out of the house and she told all the people of the town. And immediately the people of the town, they started getting, um, you know, they started wanting to see them. So... Lut al -Islam, he was surprised. How did the people know? How did they find out? And then he went to see his wife and he, he found out that his wife's not there. So he found that she's the one who told them. So ultimately what happened is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, these people were banging on his doors and pushing him away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings this in this entire passage. It's a long passage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in Surah Bani Israel. And We'll, we'll skip from the middle part where they said that we have been sent to the people of uh, who are evildoers. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers, calls them mujrimin. Except the family of Lut, all of them we will save except his wife. We have decreed her to be one of those who stay behind, meaning will be in part of that punishment. When the messengers came to the family of Lut, he said, you are people we do not know. They said, we have come to you with what they have doubts about. We have come to you with truth and we are certainly truthful men. So they started banging and they started trying to open the door. And Lut al -Islam, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if only I had some sort of might, power that I can stop these individuals. And that's where the angels, they heard them. They said, you don't need to worry, O Lut. We are angels sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they will never overpower us. And they said, leave from here and go out to the outskirts of the city and don't look back. Why? Because when the adab comes, the screams of those people, the sympathy a person feels for the pain, the fact that they will hear something, he said, don't look back. It teaches us another very important lesson that when the, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is broken and finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does the punishment, he brings the punishment then what happens, a person should not feel in their heart that, oh, why did this happen? If only they did such and such thing. This is after a lot of warnings. Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting their punishment, his punishment upon them. So he said, and don't look back. And so Lut al-Islam, he left before the time of daybreak. And he left the people. And what happened is he... In this uh, uh, passage, it message, uh, uh, mentions that the people, Lut al -Islam even said, these are my daughters, meaning the women folk of the society, of the community. These are the women. Marry the women if you are determined to do something. And they said that, you know, we, you know we don't want any of this. We, you know that we want the men. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally sent his punishment. What was the punishment? It mentions there was a great earthquake and it was such an earthquake that it lifted the people up and in one narration mentions that angels lifted the people the, the the town up and they picked them up and they took them so high that they could hear and hear the screams but the people were ordered not to not to turn back and they left and they were flipped over and they were brought down and with that they had a stone that had their, their name that were used to pelt them. And this was the adab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought because of this, these, uh, the actions of these people and the kufr of these people. So they were upside down and rained upon them with stone of hard baked clay. And this was finally the end of these individuals. The people, they knew about the destruction. It wasn't such that you know they got destroyed and nobody knew. They knew about this destruction. Why? Because it's a town. Everybody knows that. Where, where did the town go? What happened to the people? What happened to the, the punishment? And look at their uh, faces. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, go out and see what happened. Right? This is, there is no way, there is no possibility a person can take the story of the people of Lut al-Islam and prove validity prove affirming, prove any sort of uh, um, hukum that it is permissible or it is not. So we can prove it is not from the story of Lut al-Islam. So just to recap, inshallah, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He owns our bodies. These are the properties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We use them as He wishes, as He wants. Any action we do, with any relationship we have, they must be within the confines of the limits put by us, uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see in the life of Lut al-Islam, the da'wah of Lut al-Islam and the mission, the people, they did their sins. His wife, she allied and supported. And their ultimate result was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He put an earthquake upon them. They were flipped upside down and pelted by stones. This was the punishment that came upon these people for these, these actions that they were committing. So, inshallah, next week, we'll actually speak a little more about the fact that if a person uh, has any of these attractions or how do we deal in a society 
from the verses of the Quran, how do we deal with these individuals in a day-to-day -day basis? We make dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to understand these verses and understand these ayat wa akhu ta'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Subhanahu rabbika rabbil azat ibn ma'asifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. The blood donors and the yeah, urban yeah. urban donation is allowed. Uh, brother, allow me. Huh? <coughs> the blood donation and uh, like well, the BV, the ask for that. Uh, since it's an amana from Allah, as, as we know, 